Okay, so this will be the lecture on Genesis chapters 37 to 50, which is the story of Joseph and the conclusion of Genesis. So let's begin with our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with the light of your truth. Fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Move us from where we are. Change us from who we are. Guide us to where you want us to be and transform us into your likeness. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so in chapter 37, we are introduced to one of Jacob's sons named Joseph. So Jacob favors his son Joseph, which should immediately be a sign that trouble is coming because when his own parents favored him, or his brother, pending. This was the cause for conflict and strife. And it is similarly a cause for conflict and strife in this story. Jacob favors Joseph because he is Rachel's only son. You may remember Rachel is his wife that he favors. He worked for seven years so that he could marry her, but was tricked into marrying Rachel's sister Leah instead, and Jacob eventually marries Rachel as well, but Rachel will remain his favorite or his favorite wife, and Leah has 10 sons, but um, only one is born to Rachel. So it says that Israel, remember that Jacob, loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age and he made him a long ornamented tunic. This is where the image of the many colored coat uh, comes from. So he has a special piece of clothing that marks him as favored or special among his brothers who are presumably wearing much simpler and less ornamented clothes. So typically, uh, when this happens, when one sibling is clearly favored over the others, it breeds resentment, and that's the same uh, here. Joseph's brothers just hate him. They just can't stand him because of Jacob's favoritism, but also because of Joseph's own conceit. Uh, here's where we get into these dreams that Joseph has that he then immediately shares with all of his brothers and his mother and father. The first one is about these sheaves of grain. He said, uh, we were all out sheaving uh, uh, wheat and my sheaf stood up and all of your sheaves bowed to mine. So the meaning there is kind of clear. Uh, oh, my wheat is better than your wheat. Your wheat bows down to mine. I am better than you. And then the second is even more outlandish. He dreams that the sun, moon, and 11 stars bow down to him. So these heavenly bodies bow down to him. What's interesting here, though, is he tells his father this, and his father immediately understands the dream and reproves Joseph for being presumptuous and conceited. He says, what is this? Are you saying that even your mother and your father are going to bow down to you? So it's not only you over your brothers and sisters, but I and your mother and your brothers are going to come and bow to the ground before you. He immediately understands that the sun is the father image, the moon, a mother image, and the stars are images of the brothers. And I found that interesting because Jacob has a history with dreams as well. He dreams of a vision of a ladder that reaches up to heaven. And so maybe this gift runs in the family. I find that really, it's kind of intriguing. And then, of course, Joseph in the New Testament, the husband of Mary, also has dreams that are meaningful and symbolic. So um, the theme of dreams is very intriguing here. So Israel sends Joseph to his brothers out in the fields. And one wonders, what in the world is he doing here after having been told of these dreams, and presumably he must know that he shared these dreams with his siblings, and so he must have some inkling that his brothers are uh, not really happy with him. Does he know that his brothers despise him? I mean, what's, what's he up to? And we see here a 
back and forth between the name Jacob and Israel. And here the name Israel is used, and who knows why it goes back and forth between referring to Jacob as Jacob and referring to him as Israel. But here Israel sends Joseph out to the brothers. So maybe it's referring to uh, the contending aspect of Israel's name. Who knows? Is it time for Joseph to contend with his brothers to actually work this out with them? So anyway, he goes out into the fields and his brothers hatch a plan. They say to one another, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns here. We could say that a wild beast devoured him. We will see then what comes of his dreams. Notice the similar pattern to uh, Genesis 1 and then uh, in Genesis uh, 8 with the um, Tower of Babel, or Genesis 11 rather, with the Tower of Babel story. Come, let us, they're planning to do something in the way that God does. Come, let us do this. So that's a signal that they're overstepping their bounds. They're doing something uh, bad, destructive. Now, there is one brother who stands up for Joseph at this point, who says, don't kill him. Don't lay a hand on him. But yeah, we can throw him in the cistern. His plan was to come back later and save Joseph and bring him back to his father but events conspire against him. So the rest of the brothers, Reuben goes off somewhere, we don't know where he goes, say among themselves, well, what are we really going to get out of this if we just kill him? I mean, yes, it will be gratifying, but we can actually make some money from this. So they're planning to gain financially from their act, and so they sell him, Again, they say, come let us. This formula for planning is a, is a kind of a signal, a trigger of doing something against the will of God. After all, he is our brother. Now, one wonders if this is meant to be comic. They say, oh, come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Yes, we'll make money. And, you know, after all, he's our brother, our own flesh. That's what it says. So they recognize that this increases the crime. They recognize their relation to him. Yes, he is our brother. He's our very flesh. Well, we're going to sell him anyway. So it really heightens the guilt here. They plan ahead. It's premeditated. They know what they're doing. They gain financially from it, and they recognize what they're doing. They recognize their relationship and, and implicitly their responsibility to Joseph. They do it anyway and they sell him for 20 silver pieces. And then the Ishmaelites from Midian take Joseph to Egypt. So what's the aftermath of the story? The brother Reuben who tried to save Joseph comes and finds him gone from the cistern and exclaims, the boy's gone and I, where can I turn? So it's an expression of, of grief, despondency. The brothers covered Joseph's coat in goat's blood. One can't help but see the parallel here with Jacob's covering his arms in goat's fur to deceive Isaac. Now it's coming back to haunt Jacob. His sons are covering his favorite son's um, coat in goat's blood to trick Jacob into thinking that Joseph is dead. And Jacob, when he finds out, exclaims, my son's tunic. Now the brothers send it back and saying, I, we don't know if this is Joseph's coat. You know, we don't really pay attention to him. Of course they do. They know exactly. I mean, they probably obsessed over that tunic, that coat. And if his father, of course, recognizes it. This piece of clothing that he took such care to give to his favorite son, now covered in blood, ripped apart. And so one can only imagine the grief he felt. And he refuses all consolation and says at the end, no, I will go down mourning to my son in Sheol. Thus did his father weep for him. Weeping is another thread that runs through this story. His father weeps for his son, mourning him, refusing all consolation, and saying, this will never leave me. I will go down into the next world, the underworld, weeping for my son. Okay, meanwhile, Joseph finds a job. He's sold to uh, Potiphar's wife, 
or no, he sold to Potiphar, who's the chief steward of Pharaoh. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But first, let's notice some parallels between the brothers selling Joseph into slavery and some of the past internecine conflicts. We see here brothers who want to kill brothers, like Cain and Abel, like Esau and Jacob. Pattern repeats itself. They perceive some undeserved favor, and this leads to envy, anger, violence, lying is involved in all of these stories, Cain and Abel, Esau, Jacob, Joseph and his brothers. There's a similar pattern here. Okay, picking up the story again. Joseph is in the house of Potiphar, Pharaoh's chief steward. He's sold to that household, and it says that Potiphar favors Joseph. Why? He's always a favorite wherever he goes. The explanation given in Genesis 39 is that the Lord was with Joseph. Very significant. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and brought him success in whatever he did, he favored Joseph. So the Lord is with him in exile as a slave. And there's a kind of saucy incident here with Pharaoh's wife. This is the depiction of the um, event down at the bottom right. <clears throat> and Joseph runs from it. <clears throat> so Potiphar's wife is interested in Joseph sexually and makes advances toward him and finally lays hold of him. So she, of course, has a power disparity over Joseph and tries to get him in bed with her. But Joseph runs away and he leaves his cloak in her hand and escapes and runs outside. So it doesn't bother with his clothing. And it's also interesting because clothing was a big thing for him before, right? His prized cloak. Well, he doesn't care about his cloak now. What he wants to do is just get out of there. And he leaves his cloak behind. But just like with the brothers, the cloak is used against him. This time it's Potiphar's wife who takes Joseph's cloak and shows it to Potiphar and frames Joseph and says, Joseph was trying to make advances on me. And so Joseph is sent to jail. He sent to prison, to Pharaoh's prison. And I love this little verse here at the end of chapter 39. And there he sat in jail. <laughs> he was just sitting in jail. But the Lord was with Joseph. That's the beginning of uh, the, how the, the whole chapter concludes. Even though he's in jail, the Lord is with him, even there. So this is the nadir, the lowest point of his descent. And things begin to look up for Joseph from here. So this is where his interpretation of dreams starts to come in handy. Joseph's cellmates look particularly troubled one day, and he asks them why, and then they give them an account of their dreams. And they're really troubled, not so much because of the dreams, but because no one can interpret them. And Joseph responds, do interpretations not come from God? Please tell me the dreams. Okay, so the Pharaoh's cupbearer, who's in prison for some reason, has this dream where there's a vine that has three branches on it, Grapes grow on the branches. He's holding a cup and he takes the grapes and crushes them into the cup and then hands the cup filled with wine to Pharaoh. And Joseph explains, oh, this means that in three days you will be cupbearer again. You'll be restored to your job. The chief baker, who's also in prison for some reason, has a dream that three baskets are filled with bread and he's carrying them on top of his head, which was fairly common back then and in some places even today. And the birds were eating the bread out of the top basket. And Joseph explains, well, this means that in three days, Pharaoh will impale you, have you singled out for something, impale you, and the birds will eat your flesh as you're impaled there on the stake. So uh, much better news for the cupbearer than the chief baker. And so you see in the picture there, that must be the baker on the ground um, getting the bad news about his dreams. And of course, uh, things happen exactly as Joseph says they will. So then we fast forward. The cupbearer is restored to Pharaoh's household and something happens to Pharaoh. He has a dream after two years. And he's agitated about this dream again because no one can interpret them. He calls the magicians, he calls the sages, and no one can tell him what his dream means. The cupbearer, who promised to remember Joseph if he was released from uh, prison, and if Joseph interpreted his dream for him, finally remembers. Two years go by. And the cupbearer is like, oh yeah, there was that guy in prison. 
he interpreted my dream. And oh yeah, I owe him this favor. And so the cupbearer, belatedly, gives a recommendation to Pharaoh uh, regarding Joseph, and Joseph is summoned. And so here's Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh says, I've had these dreams. He mentions them at the beginning of chapter 41, and then you have the whole summoning of Joseph. And when he appears before Pharaoh, he says, uh, well, it's not I who will interpret your dreams, but God. God will respond for the well-being of Pharaoh, for your well-being. So the first dream Pharaoh has is about cows. There are seven fat, well-formed cows that emerge from the Nile River, followed by seven scrawny, ill-formed cows. And the emaciated cows then devour the fat ones. Pharaoh wakes up, says that's weird, it goes back to sleep. He has another dream in which there are these ears of grain, seven of them on a stalk, and then seven, uh, those, those ears of grain are nice and full, and they're followed by seven shriveled ears that are thin, and the thin ears swallow up the full ones. So Joseph says, here's the meaning of your dreams. And it seems fairly straightforward. There will be seven years of plenty when the land will produce much, followed by seven years of famine. So seven years of surplus, followed by seven years of uh, uh, affliction and scarcity. And the fact that you had two of these dreams means that the prophecy is confirmed. So it's definitely going to happen. And Pharaoh is very pleased with this. And he puts Joseph in charge. He makes him the number two guy in Egypt. He gives him his own signet ring and says, you are endowed with the spirit of God. And so I'm putting you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now, Joseph is only 30 years old at this point. You know, he's still a young man. And he's in the second highest position of power in Egypt. So a remarkable ascent, a meteoric ascent into power. Pharaoh sets Joseph up with a wife. Joseph marries, has children, and settles down in Egypt. And he's put in charge of the preparations for the famine. And so he's set. He's in a good way. And then the famine strikes. Egypt is okay because they've made preparations and stored up grain. But the rest of the world is not, including the land from which Joseph came. So Jacob and his remaining sons there in the land of Canaan, they start to run out of food. They hear through the grapevine that there's extra food in Egypt that you can buy. And so they go down to Egypt to get it. And when they come before Joseph, who's in charge of distributing the grain, they bow down to him with their faces on the ground. Now notice here, that old dream Joseph had that got him in so much trouble with his brothers is realized. The sheaves of grain bow down to Joseph's sheaf of grain. The stars bow down to Joseph. His dreams are confirmed. His dreams come true. So Joseph recognizes them. He sees who they are. But the brothers do not recognize Joseph, presumably because Joseph is grown and he's dressed like an Egyptian and he's in this position of power and Joseph intentionally conceals his identity from his brothers but Joseph does not immediately play nice with them he speaks harshly to them he accuses them of espionage and even has them locked up in uh, a jail the brothers in light of this uh, confrontation they recall the past wrong they did to Joseph and they reproach themselves. They say to themselves, we saw the anguish in his heart, but we would not listen. And that is why this anguish has now come upon us. So they see the karma here. They see things coming back to, um, to play. Um, the chickens coming back to roost. Joseph understands them when they're saying this, presumably in their own language, and he's overcome with emotion. He remembers what they did to him, but he doesn't yet know that they remember. And when he realizes that they remember, 
he's overcome with grief. He still loves them, as we'll see. Okay, so before he brings them back and embraces them, he tests them to see if they really do uh, repent, if they feel sorry for what they did. So how can the brothers prove they're not spies? This is a dynamic that you need to understand. So they've all come down. They initially say, why would we leave our home unprotected if we were spies? But then it's revealed that one of the brothers did not come. And so Joseph says, well, you have to bring that other brother down here and leave your home completely unguarded for me to believe that you are really genuine in your uh, desires to just get green. So they make an arrangement. Joseph keeps Simeon, one of the brothers, and demands that Benjamin comes down. So he sends the rest home. He finds Simeon in front of them and says, he's staying here. You all go back and get that other brother. And when you come back, then we can do business. Then I'll give you back your other brother. On the way back home, though, they discover that Joseph has returned their money to them and stuffed their bags with extra green. So that's interesting. So initially it was, well, in order to do business, you have to all come. I'm keeping one of your brothers. No deal. But then he gives them the grain anyway, and he returns their money to them. Why? Just for old time's sake? Just to be generous? Or is it that he wants to leave them no leverage, no bargaining position at all? We don't really know yet. So when the brothers get home, they tell Jacob slash Israel what happened, and he is heartbroken because he does not want to part with his son Benjamin the only other son he had by his wife, Rachel. And so at first he refuses to send Benjamin down. He says, no deal, no, he's not going down there. So for quite a while, they remain in Canaan until their brain completely runs out. And then when they're at their wits end, Judah steps up and says, look, I will guarantee Benjamin's safety. He even says, if anything happens to Benjamin, you can kill one of my sons. Or actually he says, you can kill both of my sons. So um, he's putting his sons in, uh, on the table there as a guarantee. You can hold me responsible for him. Had we not delayed, we would have been back there again twice by now. So finally, Jacob relents and says, okay, you can take Benjamin. But if you don't bring him back, then it's all over for me. I have nothing to live for, and I will be completely crushed. Joseph, however, is preparing a little trap for them. But when, when they come and they bring Benjamin before him, he sees his full blood brother, the son of his mother and his father, and he weeps. Presumably he saw a resemblance, he sees his full brother for the first time, his only brother, and he's overcome with emotion. Again, we see this is the second time Joseph has broken down and wept. Uh, it's a sign of some interior kind of transformation, right? It's a sign of this interior emotion. He's overcome with affection for his brother. And he treats his brothers like royalty this time around. He has a big banquet and invites them. And the brothers, it's funny, they're completely overwhelmed by the amount of food. They look at each other in astonishment, it says, at the size of the portions. And so Joseph treats them very, very well. He gives them all the grain that they want. He returns their money again, stuffs their bags. But, and here's where the trap comes in, he plants his own silver goblet on Benjamin. He has his people put his own silver chalice inside of Benjamin's bags and then says, when they're down the road a ways, go and catch up with them, search them, find the goblet, and then bring them back to me. Arrest them for theft. So that's what they do. And then Joseph, in response to this, says, I don't need to enslave you all. I only need to enslave the one who stole my silver goblet. Now, again, we don't really know. Does he just want his brother down there with him and he wants to get rid of the other brothers? Or is this a longer uh, trap that he's, he's placing here? Is it really a test of his other brother's character? But Judah steps in and offers to take Benjamin's place. Remember, Judah had promised, even put his own sons on the line, that Benjamin would come back safe. And so Judah says, 
let me or servant remain in place of the boy as the slave of my Lord. Now, this is where the moral dynamic comes full circle. So these brothers who sold their brother Joseph as a slave are now willing to sell themselves to slavery in order to prevent one of their brothers, Joseph's full blood brother, from being sold into slavery or taken into slavery. So Joseph sees a complete change of heart in his brothers. They're no longer willing to sell or get rid of one of their brothers. They're willing to take their brother's place and sacrifice themselves for their brother. And of course, this makes Joseph break down. He has to go out of the room and weep. Uh, and then he reveals himself to his brothers. It says Joseph could no longer restrain himself. He reveals himself to his brothers. And his sobs were so loud that the Egyptians heard them. And so the word spread throughout all of Pharaoh's household. Joseph reveals himself by saying, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? I like to imagine a change of language here. We start speaking to them in their language since they've been speaking to him in his language and what that would have meant to his brothers. His brothers were completely speechless. It says they were dumbfounded. And so you have a reconciliation scene. It's very moving. The brothers are afraid. They're freaked out. They don't know what to do. And Joseph says, calm down. Do not fear. Your God and the God of your father must have put treasure in your bags for you. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for having sold me here. It was really for the sake of saving lives that God sent me here ahead of you. So Joseph's taking the long view here. He's saying, look, there was a bigger plan at work. God sent me down here for a bigger purpose. So no longer reproach yourselves for what you did. And as we see at the end of Genesis, they never really did forgive themselves. They never really did accept Joseph's forgiveness. Because at the end of Joseph's life, as he's about, or at the end of Jacob's life, after Jacob dies, they ask for forgiveness once again from Joseph. They actually offer to be his slaves. And Joseph has this uh, beautiful line, which comes at the very end of Genesis, after breaking down yet again, he says, what you meant for harm, God meant for good, for the saving of many lives. So again, your intentions aren't the last word here. What you meant for harm, God meant for good and brought about good from it. So Genesis concludes with Israel, meaning Jacob and his whole household going down to Egypt with his sons and his one son, Joseph is already down there. Joseph sends for them all to come down to Egypt. Jacob is not done dreaming. He receives a vision to reassure him in chapter 46. So again, we have dreams everywhere in this family, meaningful dreams. They come down to an eastern uh, region, an eastern province of Egypt, and Joseph takes his chariot and goes out to meet them there. And it must have been quite a reunion. Joseph sees his father again after so many years. And the people settle in this place called Goshen. And for a time, they enjoy the Pharaoh's favor because of Joseph, because of Joseph's position of power. But before Jacob dies, he insists that he be buried back in Canaan. He said, do not bury me in Egypt, but bury me in the cave of my father's, in this burial place that we had bought. There's this one scene, which I just can't help but mention, where Jacob meets his grandsons, Joseph's sons. Uh, he, he goes to Joseph, and he sees these boys there, and he said, who are these? And Joseph says, these are my sons, which God has given me. And then Jacob says, bring them to me, that I may bless them. And going full circle again, just like his father, Israel's eyes were dim from age. So remember, Isaac couldn't see at the end of his life. That's why he got tricked into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. Now Jacob's eyes are dim with age. He could not see well, but nevertheless, he's able to bless both his sons and his grandson. Jacob kisses and embraces his grandchildren and exclaims, never, I never expected to see your face again, Joseph. 
and God has allowed me to see your descendants as well. So we have a happy ending here. All of Israel is settled now in Egypt. They have a protector in Joseph, and things seem to be well for them. However, there is one loose end, one loose thread, and namely that they're still in Egypt. They're not in the land that God promised them. So they're well off, but God promised them this certain land, the land of Canaan, and that promise has yet to be fulfilled. So we'll see how that happens in the next few books of the Bible. And it all begins in Egypt where things go south and they go very far south for um, the descendants of Israel. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, thanks for listening or watching and I will see you guys again on Wednesday.